لا الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه ما بعد. Despite the bad weather, we'll begin in Shah Allah, and those that are late can watch it online in Shah Allah Taala. So today, Shah Allah Taala, we're going to do one of the most famous Sahaba who is known for a number of things. Uh, and today we'll do his whole biography, and that is, inshallah, Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Uh, and Abu Ayyub al Ansari, uh, Abu Ayyub, his full name is Khalid ibn Zayd ibn Kulayb from the tribe of the Banu Najjar from the Khazraj. So his story begins in the Medinan phase. Obviously, he is not a part of the Meccan phase. Now, however, one could say that his story begins even before because the Banu Najjar are in fact related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, uh, Abu Ayyub, all of you should know, all of you should know that Abu Ayyub is the one who hosted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina, whose house was chosen by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to live in until his house was built. That is what Abu Ayyub is famous for. He is the one who is the host of the Prophet Sallallahu when he arrived in Medina. Now, uh, Abu Ayyub, out of all of the Ansar, the tribe of Abu Ayyub was the only tribe that was related to the Prophet ﷺ by blood. So the Banu Najjar are in fact the blood relatives of the Prophet ﷺ. And therefore, Abu Ayyub becomes a very distant cousin of the Prophet ﷺ. How is the Banu Najjar related to the Prophet ﷺ? This goes back to the great-grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim. Hashim. It goes back to Hashim. And of course, I did this in the very beginning of the seerah, the second or third lecture. Hashim, the great-grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, he married Salma. And Salma is from the Banu Najjar. Okay? So Salma is from the Banu Najjar. So Salma uh, and Hashim, the two of them, they have Abdul Muttalib. So Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather, the grandfather's mother, Salma, is from the Banu Najjar. And uh, therefore, the Prophet Sallallahu is related through the Banu Najjar from his great-grandmother and uh, perhaps the seventh or the eighth cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu So Abu Ayyub, seven or eight generations back, meets with the Prophet Sallallahu through this Lady Salma, who is the great-grandmother of the Prophet Sallallahu If you remember the story very briefly, uh, just, to, just to refresh your memory, Hashim married Salma and then the child was born um, uh, the divorce took place and either uh, he, either uh, Hashim was not aware of uh, the birth of Abdul Muttalib or they had negotiated, there's a difference of opinion, that uh, Salma would have Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib's original name, do, do you remember Abdul Muttalib's original name when he was born? Abdul Muttalib's original name. What did he, was he called by Hashim? Forgotten. Shaybat al-Hamd. Shayba. Shayba because he was born with a tuft of white hair. So Abdul Muttalib was born with some white hair. That's Shayba, Shayba al-Hamd. And Shayba, uh, Abdul Muttalib, uh, grew up in Yathrib, in Medina. Therefore, it's very ironic, and it's, we should say ironic, it's Qadr of Allah, where Abdul Muttalib was raised, and maybe even born, was where the Prophet Sallallahu himself lived when he came to Medina. Why? Because the tribes lived in the same area. The tribes, they were, it was divided tribally. Medina, all lands at that time were divided tribally. What your tribe was, that's where you lived. And the Banu Najjar had a section of the city of Yathrib and Salma is from that section. And the Prophet himself is now coming to that section to live. So literally where Abdul Muttalib grew up as a child, the same streets, the same, not the same house, most likely not the same house, in fact we don't know, not the same house, but definitely the same streets, literally the same subdivision where Abdul Muttalib grew up, eventually the Prophet himself uh, comes, of course, uh, all of you should remember, it seems like you've forgotten, Abdul Muttalib, his, he was called Shayba, uh, Hashim dies, where does Hashim die? You should know where Hashim dies. Gaza, all of you people of Palestine know where Hashim dies, because because of the, uh, the uh, place over there, that people of Palestine know uh, the, the, the tomb of Hashim is known to this day. And the city is called what? 
Ghazat Hashim. Saw Ghazat Hashim to this day is called after him. So the great grandfather of the Prophet is buried in Gaza and Palestine. Hashim dies, and Hashim's younger brother, whose name is Al Muttalib, says, I want the kid back. Because they had the tribalism. This is our child, our child. So he devised a ruse, whatnot, and he went and he took the kid. Um, kind of, sort of, kind of, sort of a kidnapping, yet it was something that was understood that that's what, you know, it, I know it sounds weird, but that's what they understood that the child would be belonging to the tribe of their father. And he brings the young lad back. He's a young boy. And that's why when he comes in, the people thought that Muttalib purchased a slave. Because how is he coming back from a journey with a boy? Right? So they called him Abd al-Muttalib. Remember that's the story of how he got the name Abd al-Muttalib, even though his name was Shayba. And so Abd al-Muttalib was raised in that area. Now, that is how the process is related to the Banu Najjar. Now, uh, the story of, of course, uh, Abu Ayyub's initial contact with the Prophet is well known. And that is uh, in the books of the Seerah, the books of Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, uh, very well known. And that is when the Prophet arrived in the actual city of Medina. After five days of staying in Quba, he arrived in the city and he's on his camel, Qaswa. And the Prophet enters the city and the tribes of the Khazraj and the Aus, they all come forward and they say, come to us, O Messenger of Allah come to us we welcome you some people even held on to the stirrup of the saddle to the reins of the camel and the prophet kept on saying da'uha fa innaha ma'mura let her be for she has been commanded allah azza wa jal is commanding her she is going where allah commands her so the camel wandered through the streets of medina until it entered the subdivision of the banu najjar and it continued to go until it sat down next to an empty plot of land. It sat down and it, it, to the right was the big empty plot of land. And where it sat down, eventually that became the entrance of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, and that land became the land of the masjid, okay, eventually. So this was the marking of Allah that this is gonna be the masjid. Then the camel stood up, continued going, turned around and came back and then sat down in the exact same location where it had sat down before, but this time it is turning the other way. And the house next to the Prophet now, so one side was the empty land, now that the camel is turned around and the Prophet gets off, the house right there is the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. So, understand this, very simple, very simple. The masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where the imam is, where the imam is, right? You keep on going, now you get to the extension, uh, you keep on going in the modern complex, the imam will walk in from a front door, if you know that area, okay? The imam walk in from a front door. Essentially, that is the corridor the camel was walking down, okay? And Abu Ayyub's house is in front of where the imam walks in from today, these days. Why? Because the Qibla changed direction, don't forget. The Qibla changed direction. Once upon a time, the Qibla was the opposite of what it was. So, for those of you who have been to the Haram complex, we enter from King Fahad Gate all the way at the back, right? We walk all the way to the front until we get to the original, then the Imam is standing. Realize all of that is reversed. Initially, the Qibla was the other way. So the entrance was the back, which, was now, which is now where the Qibla is. The main entrance to the Prophet's masjid for the first year and a half was the back of the masjid. Right? And that back of the masjid is currently where the main Imam stands. You guys following, right? And so, when the camel parks, when the camel sits down, the camel sat down, and the empty plot of land is on one side, and literally in front of that empty plot was the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. So that's how the Prophet was told by Allah, this is the land of the masjid, this is where you're going to stay for the next few weeks or months. And so uh, when uh, the camel returned to its original place and the Prophet got off the camel, Abu Ayyub jumped for joy. He realized that he had been chosen because that was his house and he took the camel and lodged it and the Prophet then came into his house and uh, the Prophet asked Abu Ayyub, who does this plot belong to? And he responded, it belongs to two orphans that are relatives of mine because everybody's related in that vicinity. In that vicinity, everybody's from the Banu Najjar.
Ashar. And the two orphans, their names were Sahel and Suhail. And Sahel and Suhail were brothers. Their parents had died. They had left this plot of land. When they heard that the Prophet wanted it, it is said they wanted to donate. And Abu Ayyub insisted to pay them its price. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari becomes the person who purchases the land that eventually becomes the haram. So what a great honor that from that time up until now, everybody who is praying in the haram is actually praying on the waqf donated by Abu Ayyub to Allah and his messenger. It is actually the rawda and the original masjid is the waqf of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari that Abu Ayyub gave to the Muslims and gave to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a gift for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu then resided in Abu Ayyub's um, house for how long? Uh, some scholars say one month and some say seven months and that seems a bit strange. He resided in Abu Ayyub's house for as long as it took to construct the haram and then his house, okay? Because uh, the, the Prophet prioritized the construction of the masjid. When the masjid was constructed, then uh, he made his house. And uh, it is unreasonable to think that that masjid and house would have taken seven months. So most likely around one month is how long the Prophet lived with Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And at that time, the Prophet was married to, to who, who was he married to when he migrated to Medina? Sauda, and only Sauda. So only one house had to be built. So the first house and the only house that was built was the house of Sauda. And when that house was built and the process and moved from Abu Ayyub's house to his house, which was connected, Aisha's house was the next house built and that was next to Sauda. So Aisha and Sauda, their houses were next to one another and they were connected to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now Abu Ayyub had the honor of hosting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but this wasn't the first time that he had met the Rasulullah because he was of the 70 who took part in the, in the second Aqaba treaty, the second treaty of Aqaba. So because he took part in the second treaty of Aqaba, so he is one of the famous Ansar who uh, goes down in history as being one of the earliest converts. So he converted to Islam before the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu by around a year and a half. So he is of the early Ansar and of the core of the Ansar. And as we said, he is also one of the closest in lineage uh, of the Ansar with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is also known in the books of history and the books of Sunnah as we're going to mention today, it's mentioned that Abu Ayyub's house had two stories in it. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose the bottom story and level for himself and he asked Abu Ayyub to go to the top. Why? Because he did not want to disturb Umm Ayyub when his guests came in and out. So it would be an, uh, an issue for them, awkwardness. So he wanted to allow them to have their privacy and he could entertain guests or anybody downstairs and it would not be an inconvenience to the family when people came in and out. And a number of things took place um, that uh, Abu Ayyub uh, and his wife uh, were uh, uh, upstairs and they said that how can we walk on top of the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so they moved their bed to the complete side and they slept with their bodies attached to the wall basically so that they are not uh, um, uh, walking on top of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one night uh, they accidentally dropped some water in the middle of the night they dropped some water the can the jug uh, of water fell and they became panicked and they spent the whole night mopping up any drops that they could find out of fear that the water would fall on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so within a few days Abu Ayyub insisted despite the Prophet uh, saying that it would inconvenience them meaning Abu Ayyub and his wife they insisted that Ya Rasulullah it is not befitting that the feet of Abu Ayyub walk over the head of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and so he insisted that they will go to the downstairs and the Prophet Sallallahu will go upstairs and Abu Ayyub and his wife would send food obviously to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to eat and when the food would come back, then they would partake. After the Prophet had eaten whatever was left, they would then uh, eat. And uh, Abu Ayyub would eat exactly where the Prophet ate from. Whatever his uh, hands had reached and touched, that is where he would begin eating from. Obviously out of barakah of the Prophet One day the food came back untouched. 
there was no food eaten. And Abu Ayyub came rushing up and asking, Ya Rasulullah, what is the matter? Is there any issue? And the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, there is uh, basal or there's onions in the uh, food. And of course, we're talking about uncooked. A lot of people don't understand. I've said this a million times, uh, that cooked garlic and onions, that's not the issue. When it's uncooked, it has a very pungent odor. And they would just put it, uh, you know, as basically a, a vegetable on the side to eat. And they would leave it there because that's, uh, again, um, times were harsh and cuisine was different. So the Prophet ﷺ sent it back untouched. And he said, there's onions. So Abu Ayyub said, is, is basal haram? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no. But I am spoken to by those whom you are not spoken to. I have visitors that do not visit you. Okay? Things come to me, not people, not but entities come to me that don't, don't come to you. Meaning... Uh, the uh, angels come to me and they do not come to you. Uh, and so after that, Abu Ayyub never cooked anything with onions uh, because obviously the Prophet could not eat them. Uh, also, we have a few incidents here and there from the life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari uh, that, uh, that Ibn Ishaq mentions, the famous um, uh, Sira author. He mentions that uh, Abu Ayyub was one of the uh, most strong defenders of the Prophet ﷺ against the Munafiqun. And the first time there was an actual physical uh, altercation between the Muslims and the Munafiqun, it involved Abu Ayyub and Ansari, that uh, a group of Munafiqun, this is early Medina, the first or second year in Medina, a group of Munafiqun were sitting in a circle uh, and they were whispering and saying things about the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims when they were in front of them and the Munafiqun were in the corner. And Abu Ayyub became so angry angry that he charged that gathering and he picked up their leader and his name is mentioned but it is not Abdullah ibn Ubay so this is somebody that left uh, in the early Madani phase that he picked him up and he literally dragged him out of the masjid and the man said and he was a respected man in Jahiliyyah and he was the idol caretaker in Jahiliyyah so he was somebody who was involved with the idols but now he had converted out of political convenience and so the man said that do you dare touch me O Abu Ayyub and Abu Ayyub al-Ansari became so angry and he said uh, ya munafiq, ya khabith. he called him very vulgar things ya khabith, you filthy man you munafiq get out of here you are not worthy of being in the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this was the first time that there was a physical dispute between the Muslims and the munafiqun and Abu Ayyub was uh, at the forefront in that and of course of his most famous stories that uh, we should all benefit and learn from is his response to the slander of our mother Aisha in words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself preserved in the Holy Quran. Uh, when the slander of Aisha began, Aisha radiallahu anha, of course you know uh, we went over the slander in a lot of detail uh, and people were talking about her and even those who didn't believe it were still spreading it. Even those who didn't believe it were still talking about it in the gossip and the innuendos. So one day Abu Ayyub came home and his wife Ummi Ayyub said that, Oh Abu Ayyub, don't you know what the gossip is? Don't you know what people are saying about Aisha? And he immediately said that, of course I know what they are saying, but it is a lie. It is a kadhib. It cannot be true. He said to Ummi Ayyub, would you do such a thing? Umm Ayyub said, no. Abu Ayyub said, Fawallahi, Aisha is better than you. Aisha is better than you. If you could not do such a thing, how can anybody think that Aisha can do it? This is a clear lie. This is a clear slander. And this attitude of Abu Ayyub and what he said was immortalized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and we still recite Abu Ayyub's conversation to Umm Ayyub that nobody heard except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the two of them. Nobody was there in that house. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoted Abu Ayyub and described Abu Ayyub and his intentions and his good husn al -dhan, right? His good husn al -dhan. Allah azza wa jal describes it and Allah azza wa jal praises it and Allah azza wa jal quotes what Abu Ayyub said. And it is immortalized forever in the Quran. And uh, of course the verse is, and why not when you heard this they should have thought the believing men and women they should have thought the best thoughts they should have said this is a clear slander so
so? This is Abu Ayyub. Why didn't you do what Abu Ayyub did? Now, he's not mentioned by name, but we learn from the seerah in the books of Hadith that this is Abu Ayyub. That Abu Ayyub was the one who immediately defended Aisha. He thought the best of Aisha. And he's the one who said, this is a clear slander. It can't be true. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, why didn't you do like this? So, Allah Azza wa Jal therefore, indirectly, is praising Abu Ayyub. And indirectly, because he's not mentioned by name, but the context is there. Indirectly, Allah affirms that Abu Ayyub is of the mu'mineen. Because Allah says, why didn't you do like the mu'mineen? When they heard it, they said that. So Allah affirms Abu Ayyub is of the mu'min, of the higher level of iman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And Abu Ayyub participated in each and every battle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the battle of Khaybar, another interesting incident that shows his extra protection for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when uh, Safiya binti Huyay was taken uh, by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, people did not know, is Safiya a wife or is she a Jariya? They did not know, how would it be? And they did not know, has the Prophet chosen her as a mother of the believers or is she a Milki Amin? And of course, we now know, of course, she is uh, uh, one of our mothers. But this was right after the battle of Khaybar. And when Abu Ayyub heard, he became agitated. And he took his sword and he stood guard outside the tent of the Prophet Sallallahu The next morning when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came outside, he saw Abu Ayyub standing alert with his sword open. And he said, what is the matter? Why are you standing here with your sword? And Abu Ayyub said, Ya Rasulullah, I was fearful for the lady. I was fearful. Her father has just been killed. Her people have just been killed. Her iman is just new right now. And we don't know what she might do. Might she have a dagger? She might have poison. We don't know. So I was worried for you. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Oh Allah, protect Abu Ayyub as he protected me. Protect Abu Ayyub as he protected me. Uh, Abu Ayyub as well uh, participated in the conquest of Mecca in each and every battle. We don't really have any details of specific things that um, he did, like most of the Sahaba, uh, that we don't have much details of the specifics, but he did not leave a single battle uh, from the Battle of Badr all the way to the conquest of Mecca. And after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was appointed during the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib he was appointed the governor of Medina for a period of time and he also visited uh, the city of Basra uh, when Ibn Abbas was its governor and Ibn Abbas of course is a cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when uh, Abu Ayyub visited Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas became so happy and he stood up to uh, tell Abu Ayyub al Ansari that I will honor you the way that you honored the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he visited, when he came to Medina. And he gave up his house for Abu Ayyub al Ansari. And he said, everything in this house now belongs to you. And they estimated at the time that it was worth 40,000 dinars. All of the things in the house was worth 40,000 dinars. Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet to honor Abu Ayyub, essentially handed over his whole house to him. And whatever happened to be in it at the time, whatever he owned, he said, it's all yours as an honor for what you have done for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, Abu Ayyub, there's an ikhtilaf. Did he participate in the wars between the companions or not. Some books mention he was on the side of Ali. Others mention that he might have been on the side of Ali, but he did not participate in the battle of Siffin, which is a difference between the two, right? There are those people who emotionally they're supporting Ali, but they're not gonna fight other Muslims. And it seems Abu Ayyub was one of those, that he was on the side of Ali, means his heart was with Ali, and he, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu was the one that um, you know, he wanted to win. But when it came to the actual battle of Safin, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, it seems, and Allah knows best, he did not participate in the battle. Even though, technically, he was on the side of Ali overall. However, he did participate against the Khawarij in the other battles that uh, took place. And when Ali was assassinated and Muawiyah, uh, and Muawiyah comes to power, uh, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari uh, was visiting uh, Asham and um, 
uh, Muawiyah wanted him to come visit him as well. And so he paid a visit to Muawiyah, but it was very clear that there was awkwardness or, or maybe even some type of hostility. Uh, and uh, Muawiyah asked a question. The technicalities of it are beyond the scope of our lecture. He wanted an answer about an, a past incident that would have made his opponent understand who his opponent is, look a little bit down. He wanted an answer from Abu Ayyub that would have made his rival look down. And Abu Ayyub did not fall for the bait. And Abu Ayyub rather answered in a very blunt manner, which in fact kind of put Muawiyah radiallahu anhu down. And he mentioned a time when Muawiyah and his father Abu Sufyan were fighting at Uhud against the Prophet and he goes, I was there on that day. So I don't want to go into the details because these are awkward times. These are times where it's just... And it, even to explain this and that, it takes a while. And, and like I said many times, it was a time of great pain between two groups of the Sahaba. And there's no question that we are more supportive of Ali radiallahu an and his side than the other side. But still, we respect both sides. And Abu Ayyub, clearly his heart was not at ease with Muawiyah's rule radiallahu an, And he did not like what he was seeing. And... In fact, he said, and again, this shows his bravery as well, that he said, verily, indeed, the Prophet ﷺ has spoken the truth when he told us Ansar, O Ansar, be patient, for you shall see trials after my death. Means you are our trial to us. He said this straight there. And it's couched in hidden language, but it's very clear. And so Muawi obviously was very frustrated at this, and he promised to not see him ever again. Uh, so because he had invited him to the gathering and Abu Ayyub came, but it turns out to be the opposite of what he wanted. He wanted to honor that I'm getting a visit from a famous Sahabi and whatnot. Because remember, I mean, our utmost respect to Muawiyah. Muawiyah was not of the elite of the Sahaba. He was not of the big Sahaba. Muawiyah, he was of the teenagers who converted on the conquest of Mecca. Yani the lowest rank possible of a Sahabi. That's what he was, right? And I'm not saying this to diminish because again, people get very sensitive. But you cannot compare Muawiyah with any of the Muhajirun or the Ansar. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Muawiyah is of the lowest group and that is the Muslimatul Fatih. Those who converted at the conquest of Mecca. And not only that, but he was a teenager. Uh, yani just barely a young man when that conversion occurred at max, he might have been 19, 20 years old when that happened. So again, he's just a young man and he's converting when his father converts at the very end. And yes, he is a Sahabi and yes, he is a brother-in-law and yes, there's a lot of respect that we give and we do not ever speak evil of Muawiyah as some of the people do. Nonetheless, the truth can, cannot be hidden and that is that we cannot equate Abu Ayyub or Abu Bakr or Umar or any of them with Muawiyah, there is no comparison. And Ali and Muawiyah, there is no comparison. How can you compare Ali ibn Abi Talib, the first of the uh, converts, to Muawiyah, the last of the converts? How can you compare the one who has a whole 20-year legacy with the one who has hardly anything other than a few months with the Prophet ﷺ? There is no comparison. So we have to be, again, fair in this regard because a lot of times people don't understand and they kind of sort of, you know, they, they, they get a little bit too emotional when it comes to uh, uh, this issue. Uh, and that's why it's very clear there was tension and Abu Ayyub was not happy at what he is uh, seeing uh, with uh, Muawiyah radiallahu an, and that happiness is expressed and couched in this language. Another point about Abu Ayyub al Ansari, Abu Ayyub every single year he would participate in ghazwas and his whole life was a life of uh, ghazwas. He was definitely one of those ghazis, those mujahids for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would quote in the Quran uh, every, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Tawbah, Infiru khifafan aw thiqala. Go forth and fight. Khifafan aw thiqala. Khifafan means light, thiqala means heavy. What does it mean, go forth heavy and light? Our scholars say, heavy means you are well prepared and armed. Light means you don't have preparation. In both cases, you should go forth. And uh, Abu Ayyub would say, Allah is commanding us to go khifafan aw thiqala. And thiqala, I am either khifaf or thiqal. I can't be one except the other. 
So every year he would go and he would fight. And so he fought in the conquest of Sham. He fought in the conquest of Egypt. He fought against the Murtads. He fought in the, against the Khawarij. His whole life is a life of jihad. And towards the end of his life, Towards the end of his life, um, he participated in one of the most famous um, battles, uh, historic battles of Islam, even though nothing came of it per se. It is historic simply because of its significance. And that is the first time that the Muslims attacked the grandest city in the world at that time, the political capital of the world. And that is Constantinople. Constantinople. Constantinople is of course today's Istanbul and again uh, it's difficult for us to understand what Constantinople represented for us Turkey Istanbul this is standards we grew up in this time for the last 700 years 600 years Istanbul is the capital of Turkey but we don't understand Constantinople was the capital of the Western world for over a thousand years okay imagine something we say now London or Rome or Paris, imagine something like that, right? Falling for the Chinese. Imagine Paris in the hands of the Chinese. Like it's, you can't even imagine it. It's not something in our minds to even imagine. Constantinople was the center of Christianity. There was no London. There was no, of course, New York. There was none of these cities. It was Constantinople. And it was the prize. Even Rome was nothing compared to Constantinople. Rome only came to power after Constantinople began to go down and then disappear. And Constantinople was the queen of all political cities in the world. And our Prophet wasallam said, Hadith in Sahih Bukhari. This Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. It is the most authentic book. The Prophet wasallam said, uh, the first army, awwalu jaysh, the first army that shall attack Medina to Qaysar, the city of the Caesar, maghfurun lahum. They are forgiven. The first army that shall attack the city of the Caesar shall be forgiven. It is an army that is forgiven. Now the city of the Caesar, Constantinople literally means the city of Constantin, Constantine, Constantinople. And who is Constantine? Constantine was the greatest of the Roman Christian emperors. Okay, the greatest of the Roman Christian emperors, you had the pre-Christian emperors of the pagan era, that's another time frame, Constantine in 325 whatever CE or AD, Constantine uh, was the pagan emperor who converted to Christianity and he's the one who established Christianity as the state uh, basically officially recognized religion. Before that time, the Roman Empire was pagan, the Roman Empire worshipped idols. Constantine became a Christian and he has a legacy that is beyond just religion. Even politically he was a powerful monarch and a powerful emperor and so he names the city after himself. Constantinople, the city of Constantine. And therefore it was originally called Byzantium. It was then called Constantinople. So the city of Qaisar, the city of Constantine, Constantine, then that's literally Constantinople. And uh, therefore the Prophet said whoever is the first army that fights that city. He didn't say that conquers it. He says that fights it. The, uh, 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 the, the first ghazwa, taghzu, the first ghazwa that will take place against Constantinople, the army shall be forgiven. So that ghazwa was done in the reign of Muawiyah. And just that fact alone, the audacity really of early Islam, it, is, it, it should take our breath away. In one generation, the Muslims began knocking on the doors of Constantinople. From where to where? I already said two weeks ago the story of Salman al-Farisi. Again, that amazing miracle of conquering the palace of uh, Kisra, of Xerxes and, and the, the, the Persian Emperor, the Sassanid Empire. Now the Roman Empire is going to get its turn, but they're going to be delayed. They're going to be delayed a, a while. Why? The hadith is also in, in Bukhari uh, that the Prophet said that uh, the, the Caesar honored my messenger and respected my letter. So Allah Azza wa Jal will give his kingdom a while. And the Persian king disrespected my letter and tore it up and so Allah will tear his kingdom up. We, the Prophet predicted this, that the Roman Empire will last a while. And indeed it did last. It lasted quite a while. It lasted another thousand years basically 
until, and it was multiple times Muslims tried to attack it. I mean, I, I do hope one day, by the way, one day, inshallah, to give a brief history of Muslim uh, lands, not just, uh, you know, the early time, just overall, because we need to know this. Maybe that's another few years Allah knows best. But uh, Constantinople was attacked multiple times, and it was always, always, always uh, not successful. Why? Because Constantinople was the most heavily fortified city in the world, with no exceptions. It was fortified both geographically, because where is Constantinople? Istanbul. If you know where Istanbul is, right? If you know the geographic location of Istanbul, it is an ideal location for a city, right? And we're talking about the, uh, the eastern side of the city now, right? The original Constantinople. It is protected on multiple sides, by water, by land, strategically, and then even from the inland, the number of walls that were built over the centuries was simply phenomenal. And some of those walls, I mean, they're still around, by the way. If you ever go to Istanbul, subhanAllah, and even I have been so many times, I haven't done justice to the city. You can have multi-layered tours of Istanbul. You can have a tours of Istanbul that take you through the Christian sites. You can have tours that take you to the pagan sites. You can have tours that can take you to early Ottoman, late Ottoman, uh, Ataturk. I mean, every era, Istanbul has its glorious history. The wall at the time of uh, the Ghazwa of Muawiyah, parts of that wall are still around to this day. Can you believe? parts of it, obviously. Still to this day, when Muawiyah sent an expedition to attack Constantinople, it had the walls that were built by, I forgot the emperor's name, um, fifth century emperor. He had built walls that were two meters thick, like some of the most fortified walls known to man. He builds them at that point in time. Some of those walls and remnants of them are still standing in the suburbs of Istanbul. You can go and you can see it to this day. So Muawiyah radiallahu anhu wanted to gain that honor to be the first army to, to be sent. So Muawiyah sends the army. He does not participate, but he commands it to be sent. And to give that honor to his loved one, he sends his young son Yazid ibn Muawiyah to be the general of the army. So Yazid is the general of the army that attacks Constantinople. This is the first time in human, human history that Muslims knock on the gates of Constantinople. It shall not be the last time. For the next 800 years, they're going to continue knocking. Every few centuries, they're going to try, 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 until finally in 1453, memorize this date. It is one of the most significant dates of human history, not just Islamic history, because Constantinople comes to an end and the business Byzantine Empire collapses once and for all. This is one of the most significant dates of human history. And who conquers Constantinople, guys? Everybody should know. Muhammad al-Fatih, right? Muhammad al-Fatih, the Ottoman ruler, he conquers Constantinople in 1453. And that is, of course, way after what we are interested in. But the first army that, that attacks Constantinople is the army of Yazid ibn Muawiyah at the command of Muawiyah when uh, the news spread that they're going to attack Constantinople. Abu Ayyub, despite being a very frail old man, way beyond the age of fighting, Abu Ayyub volunteers and joins the expedition. Because he just wants to get that honor. That's the only reason. He's not in fighting age anymore. Doesn't matter. He just wants to go to be a part of that um, expedition. Now, pause here before I go on. Um, I've already given two years ago the long lecture about Yazid and whatnot, and I mentioned this issue. And again, just to reiterate, uh, so Yazid uh, ibn Muawiyah, he is a person whom Sunni Muslims have contested views on. You have two extremes and you have the moderate middle. We all know that the, uh, the Shia, they consider Yazid to be uh, basically the worst human being ever uh, created and he is worse than shaitan from their theological perspective and they have the reasons for that. And for our perspective, we have spectrum of opinion. Uh, we have one extreme that praises him. We have another extreme that la'na and curses and whatnot him. Uh, and we have the moderate uh, that basically says that he was definitely a corrupt and evil person with a lot of evil, and he has some good, but we don't gain anything by sending la'nas on anybody. Just be quiet and leave his affair to Allah, right? We don't love, but we don't have to give la'na as well. 
He is not somebody to respect. He is not somebody who's accomplished that much. And his main accomplishment is what his father told him to do right now. And so this issue of leading an expedition to Constantinople is the issue that causes one group to say radiallahu an of him. And to say for sure he has been forgiven. Because the Prophet said, what did he just say? Guys, I just quoted you the hadith. The first army that fights Constantinople, maghfurul lahum. Okay? So they say, khalas, for sure Yazid has gotten that rahmah. And so he is basically, radiallahu anhu. By the way, he's not a sahabi. Yazid is not a sahabi. Yazid was born in the time of Uthman. He never saw the Prophet and the Prophet never saw him. Muawiyah was an 18-year-old when the Prophet, uh, when he embraces his time, how can he have, there is no Yazid at the stage. He's not a Sahabi. So there's no question of him that, attaining that status. Now, to, and we have to answer this question, even though it's not directly related, but I know everybody talks about this and people should know. SubhanAllah, listen. When there is a blessing in a hadith, we are hopeful of that blessing, but it doesn't mean it necessarily applies to each and every person because we don't know if the person who did the deed, that deed was accepted by Allah so that he gets the blessing. For example, we, we learn in the hadith that whoever goes for hajj and he doesn't commit a sin and he doesn't get angry, he will come back like his mother gives birth to him. Okay, so mashallah, three million go for hajj. Everyone who goes for hajj, can we be certain? Khalas, he's coming back the, like the day his mother gave birth to him. No. So the hadith is authentic. Doesn't mean everybody is going to get it. Because you don't know, did he actually do hajj properly or not? Same goes over here, that what was the niyyah or what happened or what? Overall, yes, those who go for hajj, they will come back forgiven. Yes. Overall, those who were in this army, they are forgiven. Doesn't mean without exception, no one is going to be, no, doesn't mean that. It's say, as the Arabs say, hukum lil ghalib, the, the judgment of the majority. Most of this army shall be forgiven. It doesn't mean every single individual without a doubt shall be forgiven permanently. No, that's not the meaning here. Because Yazid, of course, I don't go into the, the biography of Yazid, but Two, only two things, enough to say that Yazid has a lot of accounting on Judgment Day. Only two things. Number one is the blood of Hussein. And what will Yazid say when he is asked about that? That is something that we don't even want to think about. That is enough to really, how can anybody, anybody, like, like Imam Muhammad was asked, when his son asked him that, are we supposed to love Yazid? And Imam Ahmed said, can any mu'min love Yazid? And literally this was his answer. Can any mu'min love Yazid? So he asked his father, should we curse him then? And Imam Ahmed said, have you ever heard me curse another Muslim? Is that my methodology I'm teaching you to curse another Muslim? So Imam Ahmed's response is the perfect response. Okay, And that's our response as well. Look, anybody who goes to extremes always falls into an error. Yazid is not somebody that should be admired and looked up to. And he has enough, I said number one is Hussein's death, which is enough of a catastrophe. And then to add to that, the, the second thing, worst thing that he has done is the Harra massacre of Medina. Which is again, one of the tragedies that I haven't spoken about in this masjid. Maybe someday I'll talk about it. But the Harra massacre for three days, Yazid's forces literally killed and pillaged and raped in the holy city of Medina. Yani one of the worst catastrophes of early Islam was the, the Harra massacre. To this day when you visit Baqir, uh, when you visit Baqir and you take me as a guide and you follow behind me and you take your video camera and you say where I'm going, you will remember inshallah ta'ala vaguely I pointed to a place and I said this is the Harra massacre, the long, the long strip uh, uh, after uh, the wives, uh, our mothers, and after you keep on, on the left-hand side, there's a long strip. And said, so this is where the people of Harra were, mass were, were buried. Why? Because there were so many bodies, they just dug them up and threw them all there. They could not bury them one by one. 
They could not bury them one by one. So that's why when you walk in Baqir, there's just, just a section that is like almost as long as this masjid uh, to the women's section. Almost as long as this masjid, right? And it's just the Harra massacre took place there. And hundreds of children of the Sahaba and even some of the Sahaba, these smaller and the younger Sahaba who are now very old were killed. Hundreds of their children and grandchildren, like some of the greatest people were massacred and other evil things that we don't mention. This is in the holy city. And Yazid was directly responsible for that because he allowed his commander to. He literally told his commander because he wanted to send that message again. So again, these two things, enough. That's enough. And he has other crimes as well uh, and his personal life and whatnot. So the point being, um, I'm mentioning this so that unfortunately what happens is in my YouTube videos, people take two second clips and they say, I'm saying this, I'm saying that. So if I had not mentioned this disclaimer, they would have said I'm praising Yazid because I mentioned this hadith. I want to say, no, I have never in my life praised Yazid. Never. And I don't plan to do this. At the same time, there's no need to curse somebody. If he is worthy of that, Allah will give him that. I don't need to add and my adding is not going to do anything more on judgment day. In the end of the day, he died upon the kalima. And so he is within the fold of Islam and we are quiet at his, at his uh, fate. The point being Abu Ayyub is a part of that army. That's we get back to our story now. Okay, Abu Ayyub is a part of the army. Yazid, this little young man is his general commander. Abu Ayyub is in his 80s. Yazid is, you know, probably 20 years old now. So Yazid is the commander and Abu Ayyub travels with the army until they are a stone's throw, basically another day or two and they're going to start the fighting and that's when Abu Ayyub falls sick. And it seems as if his death is imminent. So Yazid visits Abu Ayyub out of respect and he says, Alaka haja. You know, can I do anything to help you out? And to his deathbed, Abu Ayyub says the same. As from you and your father, nothing. Don't need anything from you. As for the Muslims, tell them to go as deep as they can into the enemy territory and fight as ferociously as they can. And as far as they get, then bury me over there. That's my request to them, not to you. As far as they can get, bury me as uh, the, the greatest you can go uh, and then you know if you um, uh, if you succeed or not leave me wherever you are able to get to and so uh, Yazid did what was requested he went and he announced to the Muslims that this is what uh, Abu Ayyub is requesting so when they heard Abu Ayyub requesting this they put on their armors right then and there and that was the catalyst for them to charge Constantinople his death was the catalyst that they needed to take on that bravery, that courage, and to charge the walls of the city. They were not successful politically. Constantinople did not fall, but they were not unsuccessful either. And they sent the message, and the books of the Roman Empire also record the first skirmishes that took place. They record this as well, that the, the city put up a defense, and eventually the Muslims had to withdraw but they did succeed in burying Abu Ayyub al Ansari outside the city's walls. Okay, so that was Allah's qadr written, that Abu Ayyub al Ansari shall be buried outside the walls of Constantinople. Just think about that. Again, from where to where? Again, we talked about this from Salman al-Farazi as well. From where to where? Here again, we have Abu Ayyub al Ansari, who is just, you know, before the seerah, before that, he's just a, a simple farmer in Medina, right? And now, he is buried outside the gates of the largest, the most dominant politically active city in the world. And of course, that is eventually going to become uh, Istanbul. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's one incident mentioned in the battle as well. That in one of the early skirmishes, uh, a man jumped into the battle and he was working his way into the, the, the Roman camp. And another person shouted out, what is this guy doing? Like, mah, mah, what is this guy doing? He is causing his own destruction. He's quoting a verse in the Quran where Allah Azza wa says, "Wala tulqu bi aydikum min tahluka." This is a verse in the Quran. Don't cause your own destruction. Abu Ayyub was listening and he said, "No, don't misquote the Quran." That ayah came down regarding us of the Ansar when Allah Azza wa Jal had given victory to the Prophet sallallahu We said. Let us abandon jihad now. Let's abandon qital. And let's just make money. Now we can just make money. So Allah revealed in the Quran, 
What is the beginning of the ayah? The beginning of the ayah. Huh? We have two hufal sitting here. See, this is the test of a real hafid mutqin, and I'm not one of them. Any hafid can go this way. The one who can go that way, that is the real hafid. All of us were fake hafid. Me and you were all like so so. Okay? We just go one way. Okay? We can only go forward. We cannot reverse the car. We cannot go back. Okay? Infaq is mentioned with jihad immediately. So Abu Ayyub said, don't misquote the verse. I know why this verse came down. It came down for us of the Ansar when we said, let's just make money now. We don't need to go and do ghazu and qital. And Allah said, don't cause your own destructions. Means our laziness was our destruction. Not going out for ghazwa. And this man is showing bravery. This is not yani, causing his own destruction. Okay, so Abu Ayyub, um, uh, you know, corrected that misunderstanding. Now, so Abu Ayyub was buried outside the city's uh, walls. And in modern Istanbul, if any of you goes to modern Istanbul, there is still an area, a suburb of Istanbul that is called Ayyub Sultan. It is still called to this day. Uh, the whole area is called uh, Ayyub Sultan. And in it is the alleged mausoleum of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and it is one of the highest visited places in Istanbul and in fact it is the location where traditionally many of the Ottoman Khulafa would be crowned their coronation ceremonies would be held on the mausoleum of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and even in our generation the current president not that I'm praising or discouraging or whatnot my stances about him are not relevant to this lecture so please don't read in still uh, he also made a show at uh, that mausoleum a few years ago for political barakah if you like to make a statement of his religiosity and whatnot uh, and and so that mausoleum has become a status of Islamic uh, uh, Ottoman uh, heritage and he made a point of, of going there as a president which was a rare thing uh, from the current presidents of, of Turkey um, unfortunately because it's me who's teaching you I have to become more academic and tell you that really the entire concept of having a mausoleum over Abu Ayyub's grave cannot be true because no one can possibly know where Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was actually buried, okay? The whole thing, really, don't want to use too harsh of a term, but let's just say that you have just as much luck of throwing a random rock outside the wall to find the, the actual qabr than they would have had when they built it, okay? And when you look at the story of the mausoleum, when you look at the story of the mausoleum, uh, when... Uh, um, uh, Sultan Mahmud al-Fatih, the conqueror, when Sultan when Muhammad uh, al-Fatih, the conqueror, uh, was basically wanting to conquer the city, MashaAllah, very coincidentally, his spiritual leader, his name is Agha Shamsuddin, his spiritual leader, yani, MashaAllah, so coincidentally, discovers the grave. And how does he discover it? How does he discover the grave? When they're, MashaAllah, you know the story. You did you, you're kidding me. He just made a guess and it's the actual story. <laughs> so you know how these people work. Okay, our brother just made a guess. And the guess is absolutely right. He saw a light in his heart. He saw a light coming. And that light is where the Qabr, he assumed it was. Okay, and so uh, Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, uh, after he conquered the city then. And of course, this is, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be too harsh here but every ruler uses religion at some level for political reasons okay whether it's eastern orthodox whether it's our own rulers whether it's even the muslim rulers it's very rare to find the genuine religious leader very rare and at some level it's understandable i'm not defending i'm not accusing what not so you need to motivate the troops you need to encourage the masses you need to so these types of things they they help the people they really encourage the people imagine how you would have been if you had been in that army and the cities are there and all of a sudden you discover the grave of abayub how would that make you feel just think about that okay so i'll leave it there 
without going into too much detail. So it's very convenient that that grave is discovered at that point in time. And so, uh, so Muhammad al-Fatih then, after the city is conquered, he is the one who builds a very lavish, plush, you know, marble, uh, beautiful structure. And of course, that structure then is rebuilt and rebuilt. And I think the original is still there. Portions of the original are still there, 600 years old. And so obviously, over 600 years, it's, bec it's become its own historical legend. And it's a sight to go see just because of this 600 year history, even if it's not true from before at that point in time. Because again, and I'm sorry to be the academic, I think this is some of my problems. I, I can never be a good storyteller the way that other people are because I can't. It's just, I can't tell you these lies and then you guys be happy at it. Think about it. Abu Yub al Ansari was buried outside the walls of the ancient city of Constantinople in uh, the year 600 and uh, uh, 70 CE, okay, 670 or so CE. Now think about it. Who is going to mark his grave amongst the Muslims? Who is going to keep track of where it was? Okay, who is going to now tell the next generations? Do you think now the Romans living in the city would have kept that grave intact and they would have built on it? It would be an unknown, unmarked land. And what would have happened in the next 800 years? The city is going to do what? Expand and expand and expand, right? And other walls are going to be built. So for Muhammad al-Fatih in 1453 to conveniently discover outside the wall he happens to see, I mean, really, you know, I mean, just a little bit of common sense just kind of deflates your bubble, but you understand. It doesn't work this way. Real life doesn't work this way, okay? You just have to, you just have to, you know, understand what is going on here. So, of course, nobody's going to tell you that what I just told you, because to this day, if you go to Istanbul, I mean, I mean where are our Turkish brothers and sisters? You're going to get insulted when you hear it from me, huh? Uh, just, uh, yeah, just, just don't be too, too hurt. So you know the story, but you had believed it before this point in time. <laughs> okay. Okay, if you believe people will see light coming out and they will then just go there. I mean, and it's again, it's just the convenience of it taking place anyway. So you get the point here, you know. Uh, we don't base our religion on such, on such uh, issues and whatnot. And the point is, I mean, uh, yes, Abu Yubin Saudi is buried somewhere outside the city. Good enough. Good enough. I mean, it's not going to change if we know the exact location or not. Uh, in any case, the point is that um, academically speaking, it's just not correct to state that his qabr uh, is known because it's not known. I mean, we don't base our religion on what uh, somebody said that I saw light coming out and whatnot, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So, um, Abu Yub's progeny as well disappeared over the century, so Allah knows best if he even has any children left or not. Uh, Ibn Ishaq says that uh, his progeny has, has gone, like he didn't have uh, children, great children. Even if he had children, they didn't really pass on the lineage. So we have uh, Abu Ayyub narrated quite a lot of hadith because he lived relatively long. And he, he died in the year, or oh, I forgot to mention, he died in the year 50 Hijra, 50 or 51 Hijra, uh, because that's when... Uh, Constantinople was attacked by Yazid ibn Muawiyah and he dies in the reign of Muawiyah radiallahu anh. so he lives relatively a good life like throughout the Khulafa Rashidun and he dies in that time so he has around a uh, hundred hadith narrated a lot yani for, uh, more compared to most of the other Sahaba and we're just going to do a, a few of them inshallah ta'ala and then call it a day uh, Abi, and, uh, as usual as you know I do from Muslim Imam Ahmed Wa'an Abi Yubil Ansari qal uh, a person came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, give me advice and make it short and sweet. Wa ojiz, make it short and sweet. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, beautiful hadith, memorize it. Three pieces of advice. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, number one, when you stand up to pray, pray as if it's your last prayer. Number two, never say anything that you will have to apologize for tomorrow. Watch what you say. Number three, give up any desire for what other people possess. What other people own, don't be greedy for it. Okay, this is the advice he gave and Abu Yub narrated the, uh, the hadith. Uh, Abu Yub al-Ansari uh, narrated that uh, when they were in an expedition on the oceans, this is basically, it must be on the way to Constantinople because that's when Abu Yub is riding uh, the ocean. And so they... Um, 
uh, had uh, conquest, they had, uh, you know, some uh, war uh, booty that had been distributed, and uh, amongst them were prisoners of war. And one of the women was crying. Abu Ayyub asked, what is her matter? Why is she crying in this matter? So they said, uh, she has been separated from her child. So Abu Ayyub found her child and gave her, gave her the child back. Then the man who had separated, the, the, doing, the one who's doing all of the, the prisoners and whatnot, he went and he complained to Abdullah ibn Qais, the Amir, about what Abu Ayyub had done. So the Amir then called Abu Ayyub and said, why did you do this? Abu Ayyub said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, whoever separates between a mother and her children, Allah will separate between him and his loved ones on judgment day. Okay. Meaning that even in the prisoner of war status, even when you are distributing and whatnot, families will stay together. And again, as I keep on saying, the Islamic concept of riq can never be compared with the Western concept of slavery. It's just no comparison. You do not keep families separated. You keep them together. And he insisted that uh, that is going to happen uh, in this case. Uh, وعن أبي أيوب uh, رضي الله تعالى عنه uh, uh, that he said that uh, the Prophet ﷺ was brought some food and it had basal in it and when he saw it he said you eat and he did not eat and he said I am not like the rest of you so Abu Ayyub himself is narrating and I mentioned this uh, hadith or this incident before that he did not do this because of the angels uh, Abu Rafi' the slave of Abu Ayyub said that when we were in Egypt Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, Wallahi, I don't know what to do with these bathrooms when he's in Egypt. Why? Because they had never had bathrooms in, uh, in Medina. There's no bathrooms. There's no physical structures. You just go out in the open and do what you need to do. I don't know what to do. And they said, why? He said, because the Prophet wasallam told us that when one of you goes uh, to urinate or defecate, then he should not turn his... Uh, back or face the Qibla and these bathrooms are facing the Qibla so it was a problem for Abu Ayyub I don't know what to do now okay that you guys don't allow people to go out in the desert and whatnot and we have to go to these structures and these structures are pointing in the wrong direction now so Abu Ayyub uh, his fatwa to and this isn't in Muslim Imam we learn from other books his fatwa uh, was that when you are in those places, you should turn even away, even on that, sitting like that, turn away. But that was his fatwa. Jabir ibn Abdullah and others, they gave the fatwa that the majority of fuqaha then later followed. And they said that the issue of don't facing the qibla and don't turn your back to it is only when there's nothing between you and the qibla, when you're out in the open. And when there is any structure between you and the qibla, then that doesn't count. And this was the opinion of the majority of the Sahaba. And that's what now as well is, seems to be the correct position as well. So Abu Ayyub felt haraj in doing this. And that's the fatwa he gave based on the hadith. But the hadith uh, doesn't. And in those days it was all out in the open. So it's a different thing. And Allah Azza knows best. Um, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari uh, said when he was about to die. That I'm going to narrate to you something. I would have hidden it from you. Uh, but now that I'm dying, I'm going to tell you about it. Right? I'm going to, I, wouldn't, I would not have told you this hadith. Why did so, so many of the Sahaba not narrate hadith until they're about to die? Because they were torn between two issues. The first one, the fear that what they're going to say will be misinterpreted. So they're going to carry the sin of misinterpretation. And the second one, the fear of hiding knowledge. So if they don't narrate it, I'm worried on judgment day, Allah will ask me why we didn't uh, narrate it, okay? So they would then narrate hadith at the very end of their lives, so many of them. And Abu Ayyub himself narrated quite a few on his deathbed outside of Constantinople. And this is one of them. And when you hear it, you'll understand why he's worried to just tell the people this. He said, I heard the Prophet wasallam say, were it not for the fact that you commit sins, Allah would create another creation that does commit sins so that he can forgive them. Okay, now this hadith can easily be misinterpreted as an encouragement to commit sins. 
So Abu Ayyub is worried about the stigma of that happening. And that's why he said, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, between this issue. Uh, of the hadith of Abu Ayyub, um, in Musnad Imam Ahmad, Abu Ayyub narrates the famous hadith that the Prophet came to live with us, and so he lived on the bottom and we would live on the top. And one day, uh, I just it uh, just occurred to me, and I said to Ummi, Ummi Ayyub, we are walking on top of the heads of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we removed our lifaf, our, uh, um, uh, our mattress, and we put it all the way to the corner. And the next day, uh, we went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he himself said, the bottom is easier for me. as suflu arfaqu biya. So Abu Ayyub said, Wallahi, I will never uh, be on top of a roof that the Prophet is under. And so uh, they switched around after that. So Abu Ayyub himself narrates that he changed around because he did not want to uh, walk on top of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here we have in Muslim Muhammad, Yazid ibn Muawiyah was the Amir of the army that fought Constantinople and he visited Abu Ayyub on his deathbed. And Abu Ayyub said, when I die, then give the people my salam and inform them that I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, whoever dies worshipping Allah without associating partners with him, Allah Azza wa Jalla will give him Jannah. And Take my body and take it as far as you can into the land of the Romans as much as possible and uh, bury me over there. So when Abu Ayyub died, the people heard of his death and they put on their armor and they took his body in the janazah out in the uh, battlefield. So this hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad and it describes, as we said, uh, the catalyst for one of the, the major assaults against uh, Constantinople. Uh, and uh, one more hadith we'll do, or two more time is limited. I wanted to do a few more, but uh, khair inshallah ta'ala. Again, um, every time I think I'll do a lot more hadith, but then we go into these tangents. Okay, we'll stop here inshallah ta'ala, and then uh, these are the rest are just hadith of Abu Ayyub. Um, Marthad ibn Abdullah al-Muzani says, Abu Ayyub came to us when he was a warrior, when he was fighting, and Uqba ibn Amir was the governor of Egypt. And one day Uqba delayed Salat al-Maghrib. So when he came, Abu Ayyub became angry at him and said, what have you done with this Salah, O Uqba? Why are you delaying Maghrib? And Uqba is the Amir. Uqba ibn Amir is the leader, is well known, one of the commanders of the army, a very famous general and a very famous governor uh, of Egypt. And Abu Ayyub becomes angry at the governor. Why are you delaying Salat al Maghrib? So the, uh, Uqba says, I was busy. I got busy. So Abu Ayyub said, Wallahi, I am worried that the people will think that the Prophet himself delayed Maghrib to this time. Don't you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, My Ummah shall forever be upon good as long as they do not delay Maghrib until the stars come out. So the point here, not only the famous hadith about, and that's why all of the madahib are very particular about Maghrib. And out of all of the five prayers, Maghrib is the one that every madhab is the strictest on to pray it at its proper time. So much so the Shafi'i say that you have to pray it at its time that you cannot even delay it, you know, till after its time, after even the end time, like towards Isha, I know you have to pray it at its beginning time. Um, and the point here is that Abu Ayyub's eagerness to pray Salah and time, and his, again, he doesn't care if Uqba is the governor, it doesn't matter to him, he is going to make inkar of the munkar, and he's going to tell him what needs to be done. And also, if you really think about it, this is why the spirit that they had of raw iman, it was more powerful than the armies of the Abbasids that simple raw iman that they had was more powerful than whatever happened after a hundred years. Even though, and I've said this many times, the civilization of Islam became more powerful, yet the conquest went down. And the reason is obvious, and that is these Sahaba had Allah's barakah and Allah's blessings, what the later did not have. And Abu Ayyub's simplicity of just, I want to pray Maghrib now, you guys are delaying this salah, is indicative of again that simple trust in, in, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what uh, the conquest 
uh, were based on. They weren't based upon uh, the increase in quantity. They weren't based upon the numerical technology. And all of this gives us hope in the time that we live in as well, that it is not the quantity. It is not the preparation. It is not the uh, the um, you know the materials that we have it is the quality of our iman if we have it then somehow Allah subhanahu wa taala will give us even our own mini victories in these battles that we are fighting in our times and with this inshallah we conclude Abu Ayyub.